Thank you very much, uh, Graham, for this generous introduction. It's uh, a real pleasure and, and a real honor to be here for the second time, so thanks so much for, for the invitation. Uh, my talk tonight is about a man who managed to turn uh, his entire life into a journey, or rather into a pilgrimage in much more than a metaphorical sense. This man is uh, Vasily Grigorovich Barsky, who was born of uh, a rich merchant family from Kiev in 1701. Barsky studied uh, theology at the Kiev Academy, which at the time was uh, the leading center of higher education in the Slavic world. However, he never completed his degree. At the age of 22, he left his family, he left his riches, and he left his country. He returned home only 24 years later, and one month after his return, he died. During these 24 years, Barsky traversed by foot what are nowadays Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Austria, Italy, Greece, the Holy Land, Cyprus, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and Romania. He perfected his Latin, he learned Greek, he received the monastic habit in Antioch, and he kept walking over the land, supporting himself through charity. And as it traveled, Vasky produced over a thousand pages of extremely detailed accounts and sketches of the places that he visited. And the, auto the autograph manuscript in Slavonic uh, is preserved at the uh, National Library of Kiev. Uh, but we are fortunate because that the uh, British Library uh, just have a copy, um, a, 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 a 19th century uh, copy, a printed uh, uh, a copy uh, that includes all uh, the uh, uh, surviving uh, illustrations, I mean, reproductions of them. Um, Unfortunately, today, most of his work remains untranslated, but uh, a Greek uh, uh, translation and a critical edition of uh, his uh, two visits uh, to Mount Athos appeared in uh, uh, 2009. Um, and it is uh, this modest tome of over 700 pages. Uh, now, even if you uh, don't read murder Greek, just uh, looking at the sheer size of uh, uh, this volume, uh, I guess you can grasp uh, two things. Um, the first thing is Vosky's interest in the holy mountain. Uh, the accounts of Athos uh, cover one-fourth of uh, his entire work. And the second thing is the level of detail that Vosky put in his writing. And the same level of detail, the same care we find in his drawings, especially in the drawings of the uh, Mount Athos monasteries and of uh, the uh, drawings of the 20 monasteries, 17 have survived to us. Now, because of the extreme, almost uh, obsessive detail, Basque's accounts have been generally uh, valued as uh, precious historical sources of monastic and secular life in the Orthodox East. And likewise, and for the same reason, uh, his sketches are usually appreciated for their architectural accuracy in an age uh, before photography. Through Basque's drawings, uh, uh, Byzantine art historians and architectural historians have been able to reconstruct monuments and work of art that uh, no longer uh, survive to us. So, <clears throat> taken together, um, however, uh, these accounts and drawings, I believe, um, reveal uh, much more than the places and the things that uh, Basque saw. They tell us the amazing story of an amazing man. And um, unlike the accounts of Western travelers to the Eastern Mediterranean, Basque's accounts are also, I think, quite unique because they provide us with uh, a rare orthodox perspective. They provide, us, they provide us with the view of a compassionate insider, as opposed to the cold gaze, uh, the detached gaze of, of the outsider. Basque's focus is not on ruins or on picturesque sceneries, but mainly on monastic life. <coughs> For Basque, Orthodox monasteries and Orthodox churches are not simple monuments or uh, empty shells, uh, like in... Uh, 
uh, this engraving here from uh, Jamon's travels. Um, they are sacred places populated with people and populated with life. They are living places. But Basque's accounts and sketches are also unique, as I will try to show tonight, uh, because they blend the orthodox pilgrim's worldview with the worldview of a curious enlightenment inquirer. So tonight, I would like to put text and image in dialogue and use them not only as windows on 18th century Athos, but also as windows on Barsky's own perceptions of Athos and on windows on his extraordinary personality as a pilgrim and as an enlightener. So, I will first uh, uh, talk about uh, Barsky in general and then uh, uh, I will talk about Barsky as a pilgrim and as an enlightener, and then I will move on uh, to his accounts uh, of Athos uh, and to his sketches of Athos and uh, show uh, various uh, techniques and elements that belong uh, to Barsky the pilgrim and to Barsky the enlightener and see how they, they come together and form something truly unique. But first of all, why did Barsky leave his home? What prompted him to travel? And who was he exactly? Basque says that he had to interrupt his studies in Kiev because of a huge ulcer um, that appeared in his leg and which uh, local doctors were unable to cure. So, in uh, 1723, he lives uh, uh, Kiev for Lviv in uh, Poland, uh, which was then uh, renowned for its surgeons. And uh, here he seeks uh, to get cured, uh, and he also seeks to continue uh, his education, to continue his studies in uh, the city's uh, famous Jesuit college. Now, the leg is healed, but in the school, he only spends a few days, a week. The uh, college only accepted Catholics. Barsky, uh, who was Orthodox, tries uh, to disguise himself as a Polish unit, but he's not successful. And uh, they, they find him, they discover him, and uh, he's brutally chased away from the school. So rather than uh, uh, returning home disappointed, he decides uh, to travel and see other cities, other people and other costumes, as he writes to, to his brother. So he heads uh, southwest um, to Kosice in uh, uh, nowadays Slovakia, and then to Budapest, and then to Vienna, and then to Venice, and then he goes all the way down to Bari to venerate St. Nicholas' uh, relics, um, and then to Naples, and then to Rome, and then back to Venice. Um, and uh, in Venice, uh, he's hosted by uh, the Greek Orthodox community, uh, which, by my way, is also my home parish. I'm from Venice. Um, and he's lodged uh, in uh, the uh, hospice uh, for the poor. Um, which is a building uh, behind uh, the church. Um, he takes part uh, to liturgies and other church services, uh, which he records in uh, great detail. Um, he's also allowed to audit uh, some lectures uh, at the Ecclesiastical School of the Greek Community, uh, this building uh, here, which nowadays hosts the Institute for Byzantine and uh, Post-Byzantine Studies. However, most of the time we find him uh, begging, um, trying to get some money, and uh, trying to find a passage to take him across uh, the, the Adriatic. And when he's not busy begging in St. Mark's Square, um, he tries to learn Greek. In fact, he says that it is in Venice that uh, he's fallen in love with all things Greek, as he, he writes to, to, to his brother. And uh, not only, it makes the study of Greek a lifelong commitment. So, from Venice, uh, he ventures uh, to Greece uh, and uh, uh, to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, where uh, he will spend the next uh, 20 years uh, of uh, his life, so basically the rest of, uh, of his life. How can we describe Basque? 
Basque is a difficult character to pin down, a tricky one. Some scholars have described him as a devout Orthodox pilgrim, others as some sort of explorer, others as an ambulant scholar, others as a font antiquarian, others as a skilled artist, others as a cultural geographer of his time, others even as a philosopher. Bashki, if you want, was a bit of all these things. However, his best definition, I believe, is captured in uh, uh, the epitaph uh, on his great stone. Listening to divine inspiration, for over 20 years he walked from country to country. On the land and at sea, he endured many sufferings, and everything that he saw, he paid careful attention to. The depth of the ravines and the height of known mountains he measured with his footsteps and with his span. So, on the one hand, moved by piety, Basque the Pilgrim travels through a sacred network of shrines, of monasteries, and of ecclesiastical schools. On the other hand, Basque the Curious Inquirer surveys the land and its antiquities. He measures distances, buildings, and objects. He copies epigraphs and inscriptions, even hieroglyphs. His vision is grounded in first-hand observation, in careful examination. Piety and curiosity coexist in a creative tension, and it is this tension that sets Varsky in motion on a continuous march towards an ever-shifting horizon. In a sense, if you want, Varsky embodies the hybridity of the Orthodox Enlightenment culture from which he came, split between the uh, Orthodox uh, Russian Empire and the Roman Catholic Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, early 18th century Ukraine was uh, um, a cultural crossroad between uh, East and West. And I guess one can still uh, see this uh, nowadays in uh, uh, Byzantine churches covered with uh, uh, Baroque uh, uh, accretions. And uh, you can see that, uh, you can find the same uh, sort of uh, hybridity uh, in education. For uh, its founder, the purpose of the uh, Kiev Academy uh, where Baski studied was to master the intellectual skills and learning of contemporary Europe and to apply them to the defense of the Orthodox faith. Now, <clears throat> Piety and curiosity entail different ways of perceiving and representing space. The Orthodox pilgrim moves uh, over the land horizontally through a sequence of stations. He stops at each of them to venerate relics and icons. And in fact, the uh, Greek uh, word for, for pilgrimage is proskinima, uh, uh, which literally means uh, it indicates the act of bowing down before uh, a relic uh, or an icon. So what is in between the shrines does not really matter for, for the proskinities. What does really matter is uh, the shrine itself, rather the content of, of the shrine. And um, this uh, sort of approach is uh, clearly reflected in the so-called uh, uh, proskinitaria, or uh, pilgrims' uh, travel guides. Proskinitaria uh, lists the shrines in the order in which they are encountered. Uh, they include uh, usually lists of relics uh, and icons uh, to, to be found uh, in each uh, of, of the monastery or, or shrine. And uh, they usually totally ignore uh, the landscape, again, what's in between uh, one shrine and the other. These verses, for example, are taken from the first uh, Mount Athos uh, Proskinitarion uh, by uh, John Komnenos, which was first published in uh, 1701, and uh, which Barsky uh, took him with him uh, on uh, his second visit. Uh, now, I put the uh, translation, uh, the English translation on the screen, but I'm going to read it in Greek in order to keep the rhyme, because I think uh, the text is, uh, is very beautiful. Όποιο θέλει βοληθεί να πάει να προσκυνήσει, το Αγίον Όρο να δει και να το τριγυρίσει, α διαβάσει το παρόν έπειτα να κινήσει. Να προσκυνήσει άπαντα, από τη λαύρα ξαναυγή να πα στον καρακάλων, και ω βράδυ αν ποθεί να πα στον φιλοθέων, και από εκεί σαν να κατέβει να πα στην Ιδύρων, να προσκυνήσει και εκεί ή να πα τριγύρω, κυρών την πορταίδησαν να την ευχαριστήσει, με πόθων και βλαβία και να την προσκυνήσει. Very musical. 
Komnenos's short rhyme verses suggest that rapid transitions from one station to the next. The pilgrim is invited to venerate the icons and the relic in each monastery, and then to quickly press on to the next one. His is a sort of collection of blessings of the vlogis in the shortest time possible. And this is true again nowadays. It doesn't really matter whether you reach uh, the monastery by foot or by car. What does really matter is uh, venerating uh, the relics, uh, getting uh, to, to the shrine. Now, differently uh, from the Greek uh, from the Greek proskinima, the Russian tradition uh, places um, further emphasis on the physical journey. Through the hardships experienced along the way, the pilgrim undergoes a process of spiritual growth. As Barsky writes, the pilgrim marches either for sake of a vow or by his own will for his salvation. He visits the holy sites and he bows down before the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ and the relics of the saints. Such should be the virtuous life that leads to the forgiveness of sin. For this reason, while the traveler can die unexpectedly, I believe, not only he is not denied the kingdom of God, but he receives the crown of martyrdom through the illnesses, through the hardships, the heat, the rain, the snow, as by his will he walks to death for God's sake. In both the Greek and the Russian traditions, the pilgrim's journey is a horizontal journey. It is a journey articulated through shrines. In both cases, the pilgrim's gaze uh, remains a gaze from ground level, focused on the final destination, on the heavenly Jerusalem. The uh, Western Enlightenment traveler, by contrast, is usually not moved by piety, but by scientific curiosity. His gaze, if you want, is a, a clinical gaze resting on empirical evidence, on the physical rather than on the metaphysical. It is a realistic, perspectival gaze from above. Only what has been seen and measured is to be believed. And the fascinating thing about Basque's accounts and sketches is that these two ways of seeing, uh, the way of seeing of the pilgrim and the way of seeing of the Enlightenment inquirer, coexist and uh, complement each other. So in the rest of my talk, I would like to explore this coexistence um, in, uh, in his work uh, of, of, um, on others. But first of all, why did Barsky visit the Holy Mountain? Athos was an obvious destination for Barsky. As a pilgrim and uh, later uh, as a monk, Basque was attracted by the Church of the Origins, by a form of pure Christianity. Athos and its 20 Byzantine monasteries provided Basque with a living fragment of that world. Basque visited Athos at the outset of his journeys in 1725 and at the end of them in 1744. At the outset of uh, his first visit, he writes, my soul longed to visit this holy place and its amazing monastic community so much. I promised the Lord that I would visit all the monasteries on the mountain. So you can clearly tell that uh, he's quite excited. However, on the holy mountain, uh, he's not well received. He's just a poor student. He speaks Latin, uh, he speaks uh, some Italian, but very little Greek. And when the monks learn that he visited Rome and the Catholic countries, they even deny Holy Communion to him, and uh, he gets a lot of insults, apparently. And he's also worried about the arrival of the winter, so he spends um, a very short time in uh, uh, each of the monasteries in order to, to see all of them. The second visit uh, occurs almost uh, uh, 20 years later on his way back home. And by now things have changed. Barsky is now fluent uh, in Greek. He wears the uh, monastic robe. He has a travel permit signed by a Russian chief minister. He's received as a well-respected scholar. So he's able to spend a much longer um, period of time in uh, each of the monasteries and uh, examine manuscripts uh, and, uh, most importantly, um, sketch them. At the time of uh, Basque's visits, Mount Athos was under incredible financial pressure. 
Ottoman taxation had reduced the sum of the monastery literally to the edge of bankruptcy. And Basque records how in most of the monasteries, a uh, large number of monks, sometimes even the majority of the monks, were engaged in uh, alms begging expeditions abroad. On his second visit uh, to Xenophontos, his heart breaks as he finds the monastery sunken in debt and inhabited only by three monks. I tried to comfort them in their sorrow as much as I could. I told them to be patient under a Turkish yoke and not to abandon this amazing monastery until God will provide. I was consumed by sadness seeing this beautiful monastery receive no help from anywhere. And here one, I think I can really see the compassionate uh, view uh, of, uh, of the insider, of the Orthodox insider. You can tell that it's really feeling for, for the monks. Later on, he goes even further, and he basically says that he's describing uh, the monasteries and their beauties, uh, and he's trying to sketch them in as much detail as possible, uh, so that uh, Christians, readers, uh, will, um, um, will be encouraged to, to, to send them uh, money and help them um, rescue fi financially. And in order to persuade his readers, he tries to make the monasteries visible before their eyes, or rather, to take Athos to their homes. How does he do that? In both accounts, he takes the reader on a seeky to Athos's 20 monasteries, like in um, like a Komnenosis Proskinitarium. However, unlike Komnenos, Basque does not limit himself to list the monasteries, the relics, and the icons. Rather, he uses the monasteries as containers, if you want, as containers for all sorts of information, the foundation, the origins of the names, legends and traditions as the city to them, number of monks, their nationality, their daily occupations, their rituals, the location of the monastery, the type of plants and rocks uh, surrounding the monastery, uh, plus uh, longer catalogues of uh, uh, relics. And sometimes he also includes uh, um, edifying tales uh, um, about uh, the monks. In a sense, the monasteries act as containers for people, objects, and stories in a fashion that, if you want, is uh, reminiscent of the uh, arena sense uh, uh, Isolari. Isolari were books featuring a map of an island on each page, accompanied by all sorts of information, including notes on the island's history and topography, its costumes, uh, legends, and all sorts of curiosities. Mantathos represents, in a sense, the uh, ideal unit for, for this type of description. And in fact, uh, it was uh, uh, usually included in island books, even uh, as you know, <laughs> uh, it is not an island. Here you can, you can see an example from uh, a manuscript of uh, Cristoforo Bondelmonti's uh, um, Isolario in the Marciana Library in Venice, whereby the holy mountain is surrounded by water. And in other island books, Athos features as uh, the approximation, uh, the round approximation of an island uh, linked to the mainland through a very uh, thin uh, neck uh, of land. <coughs> And yeah, the interesting thing is that Barsky himself uh, says that um, if you see it uh, uh, from, uh, from the sea, Athos gives you the impression of, uh, of being an island. However, in um, Barsky's account, uh, Athos is not just an insular space. It is a container, if you want, of insular spaces. Athos's monasteries feature as a self-enclosed world in miniature, like the islands on Renaissance island books. Altogether, they form a sort of micro-itinerary within Basque's broader lifelong journey. Basque calls Athos a small country in which the monasteries are like cities. And one can draw parallels uh, with the way in which he represents actual cities. Captured in his sketches from a bird's eye perspective, the monasteries appear as a serene, self-contained and self-sufficient microcosms embedded in verdant surroundings, as islands on the land, or islands suspended between the land and the sea. And the insular effect, of course, is uh, uh, created by the high walls of the monasteries, but it is also reinforced uh, by the way in which uh, he represents uh, the uh, uh, surrounding uh, land. 
The difference between Bosky's accounts and Isolari, however, is that while Isolari uncritically makes the fact and hearsay, Bosky's descriptions are based on first-hand observation. Bosky does not take anything for granted. He always offers a critical reading. And I think this is one of the peculiarities of the uh, uh, characteristics of, uh, of his approach. He questions uh, local traditions and even questions the tradition that the mother of God landed on Athos. He says that there is no empirical evidence for that. He questions uh, uh, the name of uh, a miraculous cup uh, that he finds at Vatopedi. He says that uh, the name of the stone um, of which the cup is made was basically made up by the monks. He spent uh, actually a number of pages just uh, describing uh, this, uh, this stone and um, other details in the cup. Um, however, um, when it comes uh, uh, to the healing properties uh, of the cup, it says that it is not our job to investigate whether the healing occurs naturally or supernaturally. We should not examine this, but just thank our Lord who grants uh, humans with uh, such gifts. For Baski, direct observation acts as a form of authentication. Baski constantly reminds his readers that he saw this or he saw that with his own eyes. And uh, the stranger, uh, his descriptions and stories, the higher the concentration of uh, this formula. And when it comes to miraculous icons, like uh, icons uh, of the Mother of God uh, that uh, bled and uh, were still uh, bearing the scar, or icons uh, who turned their faces, uh, sight is complemented by touch. All these things, Basque writes, I saw with my own eyes and I kissed with my sinful lips. Of course, pilgrims have always placed emphasis on eyewitness. For example, the uh, fourth century uh, Spanish nun, uh, Egeria, um, was just as insistent on having uh, seen the sites of the Bible with her own eyes. And uh, Abbot uh, Daniel of Kiev in the 12th century also emphasized direct sight in uh, his accounts. With God's help, I visited the holy city of Jerusalem and the Holy Land, and with my sinful eyes, I saw everything our God and King let me see, things that I had long craved to see. Baski, however, goes well beyond that. He literally walks the reader by hand. He scrutinizes plants and marbles with the eye of the naturalist and the antiquarian. He measures objects, churches, and distances. He pays close attention to everything that he deems beautiful or curious. He wants the reader to really understand what he is writing about. And he wants the reader to pray for him so that his heart becomes an instrument of salvation. Bashki embeds his physical presence not only in the text, but also in his drawings. These depictions uh, of uh, himself are, uh, if you want, the visual equivalents of the I saw with my eyes formulae. And interestingly, most of the time, Basque portrays himself on the move. Walking grants him detachment. It is a form of xenetia, of ascetic self-exile. By giving up home, the pilgrim makes heaven his home. And in making heaven his home, it takes a distance from earth. He puts earthly things into perspective. And one of the fascinating things and one of the mysteries of uh, his drawings is that uh, they are most of the times captured uh, uh, from above from, from uh, impossible vantage points, as you, you were uh, like flying uh, on an helicopter uh, above Mount Athos. And this is done in order to show the reader uh, as much detail as possible. For example, Simon Opetra is captured from an imagined spot above the sea. We're presented with a distance, the totalizing view. At the same time, however, we're also drawn into the picture. We're invited to follow Baski as he approaches the monastery, or as he walks up and down the zigzagging pathway to the Arsanas. 
as on Byzantine icons, different temporal dimensions here are conflated in the same scene. Time is mapped on space. Time is turned into space. Barsky is, is a gaze grounded in Western perspective of conventions. It is a detached gaze from above on a microcosm in flux. Perspective of conventions, however, are usually broken by human figures, by the monks. Here, linear perspective gives way to the psychological perspective of uh, Byzantine icons. So basically, the sizes of uh, uh, human figures do not depend on uh, uh, their uh, uh, position in space, but on their importance. Therefore, the mother of God is larger than uh, these figures here, even these are in, uh, in the foreground. And uh, I guess this is the abbot of the monastery, and this is Varsky, so you can see how he deemed himself less important than uh, the other monks. Varsky also um, uses uh, grand plans to illustrate the dynamics of uh, uh, liturgical performance and other aspects of monastic routine, so that he says the reader can better understand my own account. And this is absolutely fascinating because in the text, uh, he says that the uh, beautiful uh, colored uh, patterns of uh, marble floors in the uh, Catholicon of uh, Vatopedia and other other night uh, monasteries, I mean, this, these patterns have a very uh, practical function. They basically uh, help the monks uh, to know exactly where to stand in different parts uh, of uh, their uh, long and complex uh, services. Um, so basically, the church uh, itself, if you want, becomes a sort of uh, uh, large three-dimensional map because, Varsky says, the deacon uh, stands afar when he reads the gospel, further from the center of the main nave. The ecdanis takes place in front of the royal door, whereas the apostle is read on another spot. And in another spot, I pronounce the verses, blessed is the man. And yet, in another spot, the turn is announced, and elsewhere are the sounds read. So, text and drawing complement each other. The text provides detail. Uh, the sketch allows to locate detail in space, and space is animated through performance. Clear vision, however, is not just an artistic or narrative trope for Barsky. It is a powerful metaphor that pervades his account and his life itself. It is that mysterious force that brings Basque the faithful and Basque the enlightener together. As he moves along his journey, Basque finds himself in a continuous state of instability. He walks over the land suspended between light and darkness, between safety and peril, between clarity of vision and lack of vision. Light is Basque's allied. It allows him to see his path. It allows careful observation. It allows him to sketch. Light is truth. Light is hope. Light is knowledge. Light is God. Light is also beauty. Basque's favorite features seems to be marble floors that shine like mirrors. And his accounts of the Athos monasteries are full of these shiny floors. Uh, but he's also fascinated uh, by churches filled with uh, natural light filtering through uh, the many windows. By contrast, darkness and lack of vision in general are Basque's enemy. On various occasions, at night, Basque is assaulted by thieves or loses his way. Likewise, in a dense fog, he loses his orientation and is often overcome by fear. During his second visit, Basque ascends the summit of Mount Athos. As he climbs, he is initially disappointed that he cannot see distant landscapes as yet wished. The fog was so thick that I marched in the darkness and I couldn't see ahead of me uh, more than uh, a stone throw, and I could barely see my path. Suddenly, he hears a strong creak. A rain of pebbles falls right in front of him. In the midst of the darkness, I could not see anyone, and I got so scared, thinking it could be some bad demon. I started to cross myself. Then above me, I saw black wild goats, 
and I was so scared. I wasn't sure whether they were goats or demons, for painters represent demons in such a fashion. On the mountain top, as the wind dispels the clouds, Basque finally gets to see uh, the whole peninsula. The uh, peninsula unfolds under his feet uh, like a giant map, like a green valley with beautiful thick forests and many monasteries and skids and cells and huts. However, interestingly, uh, this time he does not sketch it uh, from above, as he saw it from that privilege point. What he does, once again, he uses his imagination and he splits it in two slopes. And he does that, he says, so that the reader gets to see all the monasteries. Unfortunately, this sketch no longer uh, survived to us, but according to his description, it must have been very similar to this engraving in Komnenos's uh, uh, if for Barsky, light and clear vision stand for knowledge, dark, uh, darkness and lack of vision stand for ignorance. For example, he defines the Bulgarian monks of Zografu as ignorant fanatics. Their elder, he says, was a one-eyed among the blind. We talked at length, but I did not achieve anything with those stubborn ignorant. Close to the end of his journeys, Barsky no longer limits himself to observe the monks from a distance, bird's eye perspective. He teaches them what is right and what is wrong, what is theologically correct and incorrect. From simple pilgrim, he has now come to envisage himself as a true orthodox in Leitner, because he writes, where is education, there is the enlightenment of the soul. And where is the enlightenment of the soul, there is also the knowledge of truth. And where is the knowledge of truth, there is the wisdom of God. And where is the wisdom of God, there is also virtue. And where is virtue, there is also the grace of the Holy Spirit. So, to conclude, for 24 years, Basque walks upon the land from place to place. For him, walking is both travel and destination. On the one hand, through his descriptions and drawings, he pins down places, but on the other, there is something ineffable about his story. There is something ineffable about his walking. There is a continuous push towards the infinite. There is that deep quest for something, if only his own transformation. Basque writes to educate his readers, to open their eyes on distant worlds. He also writes uh, to move them to send alms to the impoverished monasteries of Mount Athos. Ultimately, however, he writes, or so he claims, for the benefit of his soul. When I was testing myself in my studies in Kiev, I could never imagine that I would travel to distant lands and venerate the holy sites and see and describe beautiful buildings and monasteries, church rituals, and the deeds of many virtuous men and other remarkable things. I have described everything for the glory and praise of God and for the benefit of readers and listeners without any other purpose but your prayers over my unworthiness. Thank you.